This is a presentation of BSRN, Box Studios Radio Network. The Power Play Post Show is on the air, covering minor league hockey since 2003, and now covering the Binghamton Black Bears, with news, reactions, and in-depth interviews only heard here. And now, from the Box Studios in Kirkwood, New York, here is your host of the Power Play Post Show, Bob Howard. And hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Power Play Post Show. This is the show for February 11th, 2024. Welcome to Season 13, Episode Number 21, and Episode Number 406 in the long-running podcast. It is the Power Play Post Show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition. Uh, the Binghamton Black Bears have a pretty uh, tough road coming up. They have four games in six nights with uh, three games this weekend and then a Wednesday night game um, against two opponents. Uh, obviously, the Motor City Rockers the first two nights in Fraser, Michigan, and then they play on Super Bowl Sunday at 1 p.m. against the Elmira River Sharks in Elmira. And then they'll have Monday and Tuesday off, probably Monday completely off. Tuesday will probably be uh, a smaller get-together type of practice type of thing. And then Wednesday in Elmira again against the River Sharks. So four games in six nights against two different teams all on the road, not in front of the home crowd here in Binghamton, New York. So very interesting. Uh, We will have as much as we can to cover um, of those um, Games coming up here in this broadcast. We'll talk about the Motor City Rockers. We'll talk about the Elmira River Sharks. And, of course, we'll talk about the Black Bears. Uh, Because there's some information that we need to pass along and make sure that it's, you know, understood that the Black Bears are in a situation where they might be a little short. A couple, some of their leadership won't be there. But that's going to be okay because that's part of the way the game goes especially in a long season in professional hockey. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's get into our normal stuff, our must-reads first. Uh, the Power Play Post Show is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio. Just search Power Play Post Show on whichever platform you listen to your podcast and subscribe. Please join the Power Play Post Show Facebook group. Just go to Facebook and search Power Play Post Show and then share it with any of your friends, especially if they are hockey fans. FPHL fans and or um, Binghamton Black Bears fans. Check out BinghamtonHockey.net for all your Binghamton hockey information and curiosity. And this week on the Power Play Post Show, Binghamton Black Bears defenseman Dan Weber. And I really love to uh, talk to him. I was really great. Uh, he's a stay-at-home type of defenseman, a shutdown uh, player, as he likes to call himself. And uh, great interview with him. Uh, we also got six more questions with Dan Weaver, which will be on Sunday's broadcast after the first uh, three games of this four games and six nights. Uh, we will also talk. We will also do our episode next week. I will record that after the Wednesday night game. So that'll be a little bit later of a record, but the podcast will still come out on Thursday morning. Hoping to have a guest that I will record on Tuesday with the Black Bears next week and get that into the podcast as well. With that guest, hopefully we can talk about the three games that they just played, and then obviously preparing and getting ready for the Wednesday game. So it'll be an interesting podcast next week, just based on the schedule, uh, but it'll be pretty good. So three games in three nights this weekend, two games in Fraser, Michigan versus the Motor City Rockers, Super Bowl Sunday in Elmira versus the River Sharks at 1 p.m., uh, so essentially, we're kind of previewing all four games in a sense because I don't think much is going to change other than the fact that we would have played one game against Elmira before the Wednesday night against Elmira. Uh, so we're kind of previewing all four of these games. The Black Bears are two and zero against the Rockers this season, an eight to win, eight to one win on January sixth, and a six to three win on February second. Both games were in Binghamton. Uh, Black Bears obviously outscored them 14 to 4 in those two games in Binghamton. Now, one of those games was not with Trevor Babin. The February 6th game, uh, the Trevor, uh, 
Trevor Babbitt was in goal, and it did not affect the Black Bears. They really seemed to not have too much of a problem scoring on Trevor Babin. Uh, the six goals um, in that game kind of proved that fact that they, you know, they went into it. They've heard all the hype. You know, I talked to uh, Dan Weaver about this. They heard all the hype about um, Trevor Babin, and it didn't seem to phase them one bit. The Black Bears will not have Jake Schultz. He's back on the IR. Earlier today, they extended his IR stint for another 15 days. Uh, I don't know if it'll go a full another 15 days, but he's definitely not traveling with the team, and we probably will not see him um, this weekend or even on Wednesday against the River Sharks. So, uh, and Donald Oliveri is obviously on IR as well. The Black Bears may get a player from a junior team to help out this weekend. Could be announced on Thursday or Friday if it happens. So we don't know for sure yet, but Coach Sherwood is trying to get a player, and it may come from a junior team. That is all I know, and that's all I can really tell you because, honestly, when I asked him about it, I didn't press. He basically said we might get a player from juniors, and that is it. So we'll know. Probably Friday, either you know by time the game time starts or whatever. But they are traveling tomorrow, so the Black Bears are traveling on Thursday. So the day that you're listening to this, out to Fraser, Michigan, they will leave Saturday night, head part of the way back, and then check into a hotel and sleep for a bit before they make the rest of the trek back to Elmira. Uh, that was basically confirmed. Um, by Dan Weaver and Brooks Hill and even Brant uh, basically confirmed that as well. So that's how they're planning on how to handle that. So they are leaving Thursday morning. So Thursday during the day, they are leaving, heading to uh, Fraser, Michigan. Then after that, they are going to, after the two games, they are going to travel part of the way. It's going to be a small bus ride to a hotel, check into a hotel, and then make the rest of the way to Elmira after they wake up. So they're going to get five, maybe six hours of sleep and then check in. But here's the thing. Elmira is in Danbury on Saturday night. So they're in the same position as the Black Bear. So they have to travel back to their home and, you know, it's a one o'clock start. So both teams are in a disadvantage in that regard. That is on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, so it would be very interesting. Uh, the Rockers will not have Babin in on Friday night because of a one-game suspension from his actions last Sunday versus Watertown. Uh, if you watch the video, it was no surprise that he at least got a suspension out of it. Uh, basically, after a score was uh, a goal was scored, Tate Leeson came streaking down past the. Uh, the netminder, he was stretched out. He lifted up his arm, kind of pushed his arm into Tate Leeson. Tate Leeson fell to the ground, wasn't injured. Um, and uh, basically, the the uh, player safety, Dave Jackson, the officiating head official, whatever, uh, not head official, but uh, the, the person in charge of player safety, Dave Jackson, gave him a one-game suspension. And honestly... I agreed with it. I agreed with it didn't need to be longer than that, and that was good enough. Uh, I know some people, including myself, thought maybe he'd get more because of him being a repeat offender, uh, but Dave Jackson didn't even believe that it deserved the match penalty that it got. So he felt that the referee probably went a little too far in that. Uh, that that's just a little bit of a proof that the referees can be critiqued by Dave Jackson in a way that doesn't make him look bad. Listen, he's I think he's looking at his ref going, okay, you were looking out for the best interest of the player that got hit, but in this particular case, it, it probably wasn't deserved. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Would also expect uh, uh, Ricardo Gonzalez uh, to start on Friday night. Um, he is 6-6 six and six on the season with a 4.07 uh, goals against average and a 9.04 save percentage. Uh, would expect then Babin to start on Saturday night against the uh, the Binghamton Black Bears. Uh, Motor City have the number one power play based on percentage at 34%. Binghamton is number two at 31%. Uh, so they're very close there. Binghamton's penalty kill is number one in the league at 84%, and Motor City's is number two at 82%. Now, I will say about the power play, Binghamton has had more chances than anybody in the league 
and they have scored the most power play goal. So it's it's a weird way, you know, you can look at it both ways, but percentage-wise, Motor City is number one. Scott Coach leads the Rockers with 17 goals and 16 assists for 33 points, where Connor Smith leads the Black Bears with 16 goals and 23 assists uh, for, obviously, 39 points. Uh Keys to the game. Keys to these two games. All right. Here's here's how I look at it. Because of the travel, they're going to get in Thursday night. They're obviously going to get a good night's sleep, so they should be okay for Friday's game. They have to play a full sixty minutes for both games. There can be no taking off, no no relaxing. The two games against Motor City are so much more important than the the game on Sunday against Almira. So they need to back check, four check, do it all. Do not retaliate of anything that Motor City might do to you. And I, I personally don't think that Motor City is going to do anything. I don't think they're going to be as physical as like a Danbury. So not or even a Watertown for that matter, because they they're just they don't play that style of hockey. But the but the Black Bears need to uh, play a full sixty minutes period, and they need to back check and forecheck and push the guys the Motor City off the puck so they can create chances. That's really what it comes down to. The Black Bears will then finish the three games in three nights in Elmira on Super Bowl Sunday at 1 p.m. I am not going to sit here and go, oh, this is a great idea. Let's play a hockey game on Super Bowl Sunday when likely you're going to have less than 800 fans show up in Elmira to to this game. It's going to be a 1 p.m. start. Both teams are going to be freaking exhausted from the night before. Now, listen, there are a bunch of three-on-threes coming up, and we'll talk about that here for the Binghamton Black Bears. I just find another date, not Super Bowl Sunday. I don't even know how many teams are playing on Super Bowl Sunday uh, in hockey, just in general, but I can't imagine it's all that much. Either way, I just think it's ridiculous. I don't think they should be playing this game on Super Bowl Sunday, but that's my little rant. I'll get off my soapbox now about it. Um, Honestly, I don't really care about the Super Bowl this year. I don't care about the halftime show. I don't care about the commercials. And to be honest with you, uh, I don't like either teams in the Super Bowl. So I'll probably watch the game and write up an article afterwards, you know, for my day after game report. I'll write that up sometime, you know, that evening when the Super Bowl is probably happening. But the players, they probably want to go home and they want to watch the Super Bowl. They're going to be exhausted from playing a game on both squads. I'm not just saying this about the Black Bears. This is this is also for the uh, the, the Elmira River Sharks as well. All right, the Black Bears are 5-0-1 against the River Sharks this season. Black Bears won the last game uh, between the two teams, 9-2 on January 27th. That was actually in Binghamton. But in Elmira, you can go back to December 29th, a 7-3 uh, Binghamton win. Elmira's power play is a dismal uh, 19%, and penalty kill is only 75%. Uh, Honestly, the two teams are going to be so tired. I don't expect to have many penalties in this game. I don't expect it to be an exciting game at all. Steven Klink uh, leads the team with 15 goals and 17 assists. Uh, This is a 1 p.m. game on a Super Bowl Sunday. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. It's just ridiculous. Then the Black Bears play the River Sharks on Wednesday, February 14th. So... Uh, or February 15th, for that matter. At least I think it's, yeah, it's got to be the 15th. I don't know why I wrote down the 14th. Nope, it's it's the 14th. It's the 14th. I screwed that up. All right, so Wednesday the 14th, they will play against the River Sharks. Uh, I wonder if they're going to paint the uh, rink pink, because they used to do that in Elmira. I, I do remember them doing that in Elmira on Valentine's Day before, where they painted the rink uh, pink. Uh, so... It'd be pretty interesting. Why do I think that Valentine's Day was on Tuesday? I don't know. Either way, they'll play there. So, again, four games in six nights for the Binghamton Black Bears coming up. Uh, should be interesting to see how they make out. I'm hoping they pull out five or six points in Motor City and they at least get three points between the, the two Elmira games. That's that's what I'm kind of hoping for. Uh, I think the the points against Motor City are more important than they are against Elmira. So I I, I it's not that I want to see the team not excel against Elmira because I do. 
I think their energy and their effort should really be against Motor City because that's a playoff team that they could face down the line, and it's more important to play good against them. The Elmira games at this point, to me, in a, in a way, are kind of like uh, uh, throwaways. All right, so then the Black Bears will be off, and be off on the 16th and 17th. That's a Friday and Saturday. Okay, so after the 14th game on Wednesday, they'll be off on the 16th and the 17th. They'll technically be off for nine days after this four games and six uh, four games and six nights. They'll be off for nine games after that. But then they play another three games and three nights on the 23rd, the 24th, and the 25th. Two of those games are versus Watertown in Binghamton, and then they end Sunday in Danbury, right? So I would imagine, like they normally do for Danbury games, they'll 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 get up and they'll go down Sunday. It's an earlier game, so we'll see how that works. They may have to leave a little bit early, but the guys should get a full night's of sleep. That's why I don't think that three and three is as bad as the three and three that they're going to play this upcoming weekend. Okay, um, after that three and three night, three games and three nights, the Blackbirds will still have another three. Three games and three nights. And if that isn't a tongue twister, I don't know what is. So basically, the Black Bears are starting five, three games and three nights over the next, well, the rest of the season, right? So there's a lot. So five games. So there's three weekends or five weekends with three games. That's 15 games of the remaining games that they're playing back to back to back. Okay, so that's pretty big. So we're in the toughest part of the schedule. I don't care what anybody says with the team, the players. This is going to be the toughest part of the schedule for these guys. Okay, because by Monday morning, I don't care what job they have when they aren't at the rink. They're going to be exhausted five more weekends before the playoffs start. I don't think I can emphasize enough how tough three games and three nights are. The AHL doesn't even scheduled that anymore they don't they've gotten away they got away from it 10 years ago so it's an important factor to think about these guys need to be rested they need to really think about the end prize here which is winning a championship they're one of the best teams them and columbus should meet in the finals that those are the two teams that really deserve to be there so these five weekends where there are three games and three nights they really have to think about how they prepare for those weekends and whatnot. It's a tough job for Coach Sherwood, Tom Reynolds, Andreas, getting the team ready for those uh, five weekends where there's three games and three nights. Now, again, they play four games and six nights coming up this weekend, and then they have a whole weekend off. It actually turns into like a nine-day respite. So be very interesting. Okay. I think this is the toughest three games and three nights for the Black Bears coming up. So it, it'll be a little bit better because of the way the schedule is. Uh, 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 I know th- at least three or four of those upcoming three games and three nights, it's two games in Binghamton, and then they go on the road on Sunday because Binghamton doesn't play a lot of Sunday games. So that's pretty much it. I, I really want to emphasize win in Motor City, win in Frazier, Michigan. That's really the important factor here. And then just really have enough in the tank maybe for Elmira and then come back home, a couple days off, then play in Elmira again. And and that's where you could really – like if you lose in Elmira on Sunday but you got five or six points out of Motor City, I think – it's fine. Whatever happens on Sunday happens. If Elmira squeaks out a win or the, it's an overtime loss or whatever, not a big deal because you got two days to rest up and then go back to Elmira and get that big win, right? So you kind of have to look at it that way. You you can't imagine a team four games and six nights and getting 12 points out of it. You just you can't expect that. You can't put that pressure on the guys. They might put try to put that pressure on themselves, but fans and media can't do that. So we're going to just hope that it uh, turns out well for them. Either way. So coming up next here on the Power Play Post Show, I'm very excited to have him on. He comes to us, obviously, for the Binghamton Black Bears. He's one of the stay-at-home defensemen. I think these guys are huge. They're so important on any championship team. you got to have – if you have three D-lines, you need to have – Three guys that will stay home. 
They're stay-at-home defensemen. They protect the goalie. They protect the puck-moving defensemen, right? It's a strategy. It's a it's a philosophy in hockey that you pair up uh, a guy who can move the puck really well and a guy who knows to stay back and to guard and to watch and to uh, help the team avoid those odd man breaks and everything because he's pulling back just a little bit and whatnot. And Dan Weber is one of those guys. He's been like that. He said his, almost his whole career, a shutdown kind of defenseman. Um, that's that's what he is. And uh, so that's the interview we have coming up next. Uh, on the Power Play Post Show, I am Bob Howard. We'll be right back right after this with Dan Weber on the Power Play Post Show. You're listening to the Power Play Post Show. Here is another Power Play Post Show interview exclusive with Bob Howard. And welcome back, everybody, to the Power Play Post Show. Uh, really excited to have this gentleman on. Uh, first of all, he comes from the one of the best hockey states in the country. He comes from Minnesota, actually. We'll talk to him a little bit about that, but he is a Binghamton Black Bears defenseman, one of the stay-at-home defensemen, which I really love to watch uh, these guys play on the ice uh, he is Dan Weber. Dan, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on, and uh, you know, thank you for taking some time out for us. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. When I got asked if I would do this, I was more than happy to help out and just answer any questions and tell you a little bit about me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, Dan, as I said, you, you come to us uh, from Minnesota and everything, and uh, obviously, my favorite college hockey team, if anyone has ever been listening to my show in the last 20-some years, knows that I am a, Go- a Golden Gophers fan. Uh, I know you like them in football and everything, but talk to me a little bit about where in Minnesota you grew up and, and a little bit about y- your town. So, to rival the Gophers, I'm a St. Cloud State fan. That's where I grew up. I had uh, season tickets up until I was about 10 or 12 right next to the penalty box on the glass. Nice. I'd go to those games, be banging, and I'd be the little kid screaming at the guy in the penalty box (laughs) whenever an opposing fan or opposing player took a penalty. And so I was that annoying little kid, so I give it back to the kids now. Oh, do you? you? Wait, no, hold on. You're already jumping ahead to being a pro. So if you're in Danbury and you're in the penalty box, which I don't think you've been in the penalty box that much this year, and a kid comes up and starts giving to you, you're going to give it back to him, right? I'll I'll look at him and I'll smile. I'll give him some stick taps. (laughs) I won't say anything, but I just let him know I'm hurt. Let him know he's hurt. That's all I wanted when I was younger. So how, 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 like, I, I know that in you know in Michigan, uh, Massachusetts, football and hockey are huge. Soccer is pretty big as well. When you were a youth, was it pretty simple you were going to be a hockey player, or did you play some of the other sports as well? Um, I my parents put me through all the sports and just kind of let me choose what I kind of wanted. And I fell in love. With, I fell in love with hockey just. Because it was kind of what my friends were doing, too, and I just kind of grew a natural nick for it, so I was happy to keep doing it. And then it just became easier to keep playing hockey because of the convenience of the outdoor rinks, and everyone just kind of wanted to pick up a stick and skate on the river or skate on the lake or skate on the outdoor rink in the in the neighborhood. And So it was just a really easy thing to keep playing and keep practicing, and this one reason I love it is just everyone – can enjoy it whether your skill is pro or your skill is first time putting on a pair of rental skates it's always just a good time now how like for for you you know and everything youth hockey uh how competitive is it in minnesota i mean i know it's pretty competitive but can you explain to the fans how competitive minnesota hockey is at all the different levels or because age groups it's it starts pretty early you probably started skating when you were three or four years old yeah, that is when I started skating was at three years old. I My parents brought me to the rink every, we used, I think it was every Tuesday, Thursday until 
or all summer, it's every Tuesday, Thursday, and as soon as winter came, it's every single day, all the way to September, all the way to March, <laughs> from three years old until I graduated high school. My parents would take me to everything. Gotcha. So I really thanked them, but really competitively, it was very competitive. Um, we had every age group had five teams. Uh, wow. Double A. And then, so they've changed it since I've been going there, but we had an A team, a B1, a B2, and then a C1 and a C2. And then, depending how good it was, we would have do two A teams or two or three B teams, and depending on how good the skill was of the players. But, yeah, it was really competitive all the way up. You're battling with your best friends. You're making the team with your best friends. You're watching your friends make the better team, so it's always... You want to be on that best team, so it's always competitive. And now I, I was gonna, go ahead. No, I was gonna yeah. say a lot of the a lot of players. You know, if you're in New York, you're 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 doing a lot of travel for hockey. There's, you know, you can play local uh, hockey here in Binghamton. They obviously have the organization here, and there are some teams. But you still do a lot of travel. How much travel in Minnesota? With there being pretty much that many hockey teams locally for you. How much travel do you still have to do even as a kid? It wasn't a lot of travel until I would say about seven or eight years old because where I grew up there was St. Cloud and then probably four or five different neighboring cities that had enough population to get their own hockey teams and fill rosters. So when I was younger, we only had to travel 15, 20 minutes and we would just play in-house because we weren't, no one was really good enough to play. It didn't really matter who you were playing. You were just following the puck around. So um, as soon as we got older and more competitive, we would travel anywhere from an hour to three hours away up to Mm. Grand Forks in North Dakota. We'd play there or we'd go up to the other corner in Duluth. It was kind of tournaments every weekend and then, 12 teams show up to that tournament every weekend. It's just different places, and you just try to get a sweatshirt with a championship words across the chest. <laughs> no, absolutely. Now, how much did you guys get to go down? Because you're just a well, – I, I imagine where you grew up about an hour or so outside of uh, Minneapolis. So how often were you guys going down into Minneapolis to, to play when it came to youth hockey? Was there a lot of tournaments down in uh, Minneapolis? Oh, there's a ton of them. Sometimes two in a diff- in the r- two tournaments in the same rink, mm. just different ice sheets. I mean, it it's winter's a crazy time just in a hockey world for youth hockey. There's tournaments every weekend. Hotels have kids playing ball hockey and knee hockey in the hallways. It's it's such a good time <laughs> to play hockey from the ages seven to. 13. There's a little tournament on the weekends. And we would travel down to Minneapolis or way up north. It really didn't matter. Either one, any weekend. South or north, we traveled all over. Now, as you started to get older, um, I, I, I see on your um, uh, elite prospects, uh, Apollo High. Talk a little bit about Apollo High. I'm guessing that was your high school and everything that you played uh, there. Were you playing defense even at that age? I was. I've I played D my whole life except a couple years in college, which we can get to later. But yeah, so um, St. Cloud, it's a really big city. Mm-hmm. There's three high schools there, two public schools and one private. Public schools are St. Cloud's not the nicest city, but if you hang out and hang out with the right crew, you would keep your nose clean. So the hockey team of Paula High wasn't the nicest school, but it was great hockey I had a lot of my friends growing up came there but because we did have three high schools a lot of my friends went to the other public school or the private school so it kind of drove a wedge between some friendships and friendships that became enemies and really not like angrily but like you, we wouldn't On hang the out ice. anymore because they yeah they just it, t- tensions became high a couple of times because us in the private school would always go back and forth between who went to state because we were the top teams in our section. So we just had really 
really high tensions and really high caliber games against Cathedral was the name of the private school. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting. And then, like, going to state, I mean, that's one of, like, the coolest things you can do in the eyes of, like, a Minnesota kid that doesn't go play pro hockey. Right. You go to the XL Energy Center. I mean, I played in the single A, which is the lower division or smaller high schools of the two divisions, the single A and double A. Mm -hmm. So I played in the smaller one, which doesn't get as many fans or as much recognition because it's not as good hockey just because it's smaller schools. So when I went my junior year, I think we played in front of 6,000 people just, Wow. No, no idea who they were. Anyone? They just filled the XL Energy Center to come watch us. We went into overtime, and we scored the overtime winner in our first game. It was one of the coolest things ever. And then just doing it in front of thousands of people is so cool. In the XL Energy Center, where the Wild played, it was like a dream come true. Because <laughs> you want to make it there so far, but we didn't. We ended up not winning the tournament, but it was a great experience overall. Yeah, when you play on the big ice like that, you just you just see things a little bit differently. I know I've I've spot, uh, spoken to a couple of players, uh, you know, just from the Black Bears this season, where and you know going and playing at Lake Placid, you know, uh, Gavin Yates played on Lake Placid, where you know the Miracle on Ice and all that really kind of drives from and everything. And to them and to him, playing on that and winning a championship on that ice was probably the best, you know, one of the, he said it was one of the best things he's ever done uh, in his in his career. So I got to imagine playing on the big ice there where the wild play, where the logo is, that had to be a big thing for you guys. Oh, it was incredible. I mean, we stayed in the, we were, we were fortunate to be in the away visiting locker room. So, I mean, we got treated like royalty. We had a huge locker room, best showers. And so, I mean, we took it all in and, the whole facility and the whole tournament takes care of you. There's a whole hockey expo. Mm-hmm. Which they fill the whole concourse of the Echo Energy Center up with vendors and games and shooting, skating, treadmills and stuff. And it's a huge weekend event, and it's so fun to be part of, even if you're not even playing in it. I've gone every year I've been in Minnesota, I've gone to whether I play in it or not. It's just something awesome to be a part of. Now, Dan, I, I, when when we were setting up the interview, uh, Brooks uh, told me that you were working with one of the high school teams here locally uh, yesterday. You know, and, and obviously, you know, giving back. You know, when you become a pro player and you start giving back to the community that you're playing in, is obviously kind of important. Um, you know, you, you obviously played high school hockey and then obviously went into juniors and everything. And, you know, can you talk, talk to us a little bit about what you were doing yesterday, which which t- which school it was with that you were helping with? Yeah, it was uh, Broome County High School. It's more than one high school. Yep. I think I was talking to the kids, it's two or three. And so we went out to this gorgeous outdoor rink um, on this gentleman's farm where the high school team practices every day. And I was nice enough to let us skate the night before, and we skated for three, four hours just shooting on our own guy. There's only three of us out there. But then we came back the next day and were helping the high school team. We ran them through just a bunch of drills and kind of broke down, like, all right, on a two-on-one, if the defenseman's way over here, just like we just ran them through, like, thought process options of how to look at situations and just ran through a bunch of just offensive drills, get the – blood flow and and we hopped in the drills and we got the energy going and it was a lot of fun skating with those guys yeah i was good around and i was i was gonna outside yeah i was gonna ask you about that you know uh you know obviously that's giving back right and you, you played high school hockey what did you what did you what did you what did you see in 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 those players yesterday you know is it is the competitiveness as as much as it, because because you got to understand, hockey in New York, there are teams, there are pro teams in almost every single city in you know the state of New York, and 
you know, New York has had a lot of minor league and a lot of high school hockey, a lot of junior hockey, the Syracuse Stars, Rochester Stars. They, they have uh, junior clubs that have done very well and everything. What did you see in the competitiveness of the, the players yesterday? You know, is there somebody that you're like, wow, you know, this, this kid's got a chance to, you know, maybe play pro, semi-pro at, at, at some point. Did you see that kind of same competitiveness that you saw maybe in Minnesota? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you look at any guy, it's not so much like a team. It is just like how much one person cares. If you would have looked at me back when I was in high school, I don't, I doubt you would have ever thought I would have known to say anything. But I just kind of kept my nose to the grindstone and ended up here. So I told the, like any of those guys asked like how he got it. Like, you just work hard and you just keep playing hockey. Just, if you love it, it'll work yeah. out. That's how I kind of approached it. So I told all those guys, like, hey, just keep playing hockey, and if you get the chance to better yourself, Mm-hmm. Do it. Like, go shoot pucks, go work out, go skate that extra time. And it all just it helps you in the long run. So that's the kind of message I was sending those guys. Like, it's not always just the best guy on the team. I wasn't always the best guy on the team growing up. But I've made farther than any of my guys I graduated high school with, even though I wasn't the top guy on the team. Right. So, right. Sometimes it's heart and sometimes it's that determination that you have that makes the difference. Um, Breezy Point North Stars. I, what I love about the name is, is first of all, it's you know paying homage to the Minnesota North Stars, which was the the first team uh, before the Wild came in. You know, the, obviously we all know the North Stars. You know, basically moved down to Dallas and everything and became the Dallas Stars and and whatnot. So I, I love the fact that you know there's there's people still paying homage to the, the North Stars and everything. Uh, how did you get um, from high school to a uh, Breezy Point and playing in the uh, uh, the NA3. Uh, so in my hometown is also another NA3 team that I had been in contact with. I had never gone, never contacted Breezy Point, anything, didn't know if the team even existed, to be honest. So then I'm talking to this hometown team, Granite City Lumberjacks, also in NA3 there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, they asked me to come send a tender, and I said, okay, I'll come in. And then I was just lazy and ended up never going in. Deadline closed. They said, hey, we gave your tender to someone else. We're just going to draft you. And I was like, all right, that works. <laughs> so then first round in the draft, Breezy Point has draft pick numbers 10 or something like that. And they just picked me up because they heard my name, didn't get tendered. So I Breezy Point drafted my rights before uh, Granite City Lumberjacks could, so didn't want to go up there but I just I was also excited to keep playing hockey another opportunity to keep playing so I took it and then from then on I every year I'd try out for another team got cut I'd go back just ended up and then the coach would call me he says hey I'll, if you come back I'll give you a letter so went back again for a third year loved it I mean I love the guys and the atmosphere is there so the North Stars, I, because I have a letter on my jersey, I tried incorporating as much of the North Stars logo as I could, as much and get as much apparel as I could, because I was also a big fan of the North Stars. So I, I have to ask you, uh, junior hockey, how different was it when you uh, went from high school to playing NA3? I would have to imagine it's a big step up, not just the the players that you're playing with, but the players you're playing against, because you guys are going to sometimes play against some really good guys that will eventually, you know, make it pro as well. Yeah, exactly. So the NA3 in Minnesota, I would, like the west of the NA3 is probably the most competitive division of the NA3. And then, but you also have those teams that aren't very good. So like, right. Granite City was a top team, so like, and then Breezy Point wasn't the top team, so it kind of sucked playing against my hometown team because we would just get stomped. But it was competitive against all the other teams. We put up a fight. We were first in the division for a while, and it was a lot of fun competitively within the division. But a lot of those teams, they had not the guys that were exceptionally good, they were gone quickly. So I was 
just kind of fighting against the same guys every week, mm. every day. <laughs> well, your a second games. your second year there, you had 111 penalty minutes. I got to imagine there was a few scraps in that one. Yeah, that year I had uh, we had a guy that kept running his mouth, and he was a smaller guy, and <laughs> so I'm not many of those I'm proud of. Not many of those fights that I'm proud of. So you know, I. I, had a, uh, I shouldn't have fought a lot of them. That's all I'm saying. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't the most fun for me. Understandable, understandable. So, um, again, your last year, junior, you, you had a letter on your uh, chest. What did it mean to then start becoming a leader um, for the team? Because, obviously, you know, it means a lot when the coach, you know, puts a letter on your jersey. Yeah, it does because, I mean, it, it means a lot. I have a lot of respect for our leaders that we have here because it does take a lot. I mean, you deal with a lot of the extra stuff that normal people don't think about. There's a lot of, like, all our volunteering, all our little things, like making sure people go to them, make sure they're doing, making sure everyone's signed up for this. Yeah. It's just a lot more stuff outside the rink than I had ever imagined. So, I mean, I try to be, like, as easy as I can to a captain and just, like, if they need help volunteering, like, I'll go there. If they need something done like i'm happy to help just because like i know it, it is a struggle being the guy that everyone looks at like when it's, things aren't going well because we started off really bad in breezy point when i did have the letter in it everyone was looking at me and i just didn't know what, <laughs> i didn't know how to respond i looked at the coach but things are going well and it's easy it's fun mm-hmm. so i have a lot of respect for our captains our assistant captains here was it was it an easy decision to go play for uh, St. John's University? Uh, uh, NCAA Division Three hockey it has really grown over the past, I would say, twenty years. And obviously, you don't know what it was like twenty years ago. But obviously, you played, uh, you know, four years for St. John's. Can you, was it an easy decision to go to St. John's? Yeah. So I'm. I grew up with a. Uh, big chunk of property in the backyard kind of an outdoorsy guy and St. John has one of the nicest outdoor arboretums thousands of acres so mm-hmm. it was kind of homey to go there Right. so I enjoyed it and every person I met was just had that Minnesota nice and then it was kind of that policy they tried to just bring in good people so no, I didn't really meet anyone that I really hated through all the way through all college. So it was just kind of an easy, fun experience to have. Happy I went, and then every player, every student, every teacher, faculty in the whole um, university was just wanting to help you, which was just it was an easy thing to be there. I loved it there. What did you learn about yourself as a player playing, you know, college hockey? Because it, 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 when you go from juniors to college, and there's different rules in college than there is when you're playing in juniors, it's it's a, it's a, it's an adjustment that most players have to make. Uh, what was that like for you? And what did you learn about yourself? Um, <laughs> so in juniors, I was kind of the guy that like would answer the bell, but yeah. in college. You can't fight, so there's no answering the bell. Mm-hmm. Or there's nothing like that. So, and uh, I got moved to forward, and I was this freshman, ton of energy, six foot two, heavier guy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go <laughs> run people through these boards, and <laughs> I, um, I did it exceptionally well my freshman year. I didn't. I, all I did was just go hit people as hard as I could and just turn pucks over, mm-hmm. and it worked worked well for me. I've played a lot of minutes coach liked me up front and I it was a lot of fun I felt like I could be more scummy and just hit people a lot <laughs> I don't it was kind of a weird thing but I was like coming here I was like wow now I actually have to like not run around trying to take people's heads off because someone will pump my face in yeah no I, I totally get that so um playing forward um that was different for you at first but you Sounds like you were able to do it and do it well. What was the decision to to go back to defense then? Um, kind of, I told my 
so my first ever game was at a forward because I had a broken hand. So one of my forwards got sent to the hospital right before the game, so I filled in as a extra forward. And then we had a D come in off our healthy mm-hmm. scratch list. So I just was like, I knew my only role was go out there and hit somebody because I have a broken hand. I can't really do anything. Right. <laughs> so I knew my role at forward, and I told the coach, I'll do this until I, you need me a D because I have, I'm having fun. I'm, I'm getting on the score sheet, which, and I'm, which I can't complain about. So then sophomore year, I t- took a couple games back at D, and then junior year, he recruited really forward heavy. The freshman class we brought in my junior year is mostly forward, so then I stepped back and played D, and then junior and senior year I played D, just locking it down, doing my best I can. You know, you played, uh, obviously, Division Three uh, hockey for four years. You've now seen um, three or four guys come from Adrian College, one of the top club teams in the country and everything. Um you know, Stanko has you know been up in the SP uh, doing really well. I mean, and what he did in the first you know twelve games, whatever it was, is just kind of ridiculous. Connor Smith, big boy, can hit, he, he can score. Um, obviously, you know the two defensemen just uh, you know they just are lockstep. They know which what each other going to do. Uh, you know, with, with Dakota Bond and everything. Can can you talk a little bit about the difference between? D- D3 hockey and what you've seen from these club guys because I, I really truly believe they belong as much here being club teams and being from one of the best club teams in the country you know along with the division three guys that are also on here or the SUNYAC guys oh well, that's where we disagree I do not think they should be here no <laughs> I'm kidding I, <laughs> I go back and forth with those guys all the time because I played NCAA they played ACHA. Yeah. And so, I, funny story, I actually toured Adrian College my first year of juniors because mm-hmm. I wasn't really feeling juniors. So, I toured Adrian College to go to the their club team and play. With that. So, I could have played with them, which is the funny part. But I was yeah. joking. I was like, no, I didn't want to. You guys weren't good enough. But, right. No, but they have a great program over at Adrian. They have multiple championships, which is. I think Dan Stone has two. Yes. Um, Dakota Bond has one. Smith has one. So it's when you put in all the national championships, you kind of look at the program. Like they have it figured out. And so, like, Sherwood has no problem recruiting guys from there because you look at what they've brought to our team. Stanko moved up. Smitty's been a huge asset on the offensive side. And then we have our two Bulldog defensemen that play well together. So it's. I hope they don't listen to this because <laughs> <laughs> it's going to go against everything I've been saying the whole past four months. Yeah. <laughs> but no, the, the top club teams like ACHA they are very competitive with like the NCAA D, the lower end D threes. Like I'm not going to give it to them. They're not, they can't compete with the top NCAA teams. I'm not going to give it to them. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. But there are. I was just going to say, it's kind of funny because I, I do have this running joke on the show that if you took four of the Adrian Bulldogs, well, we'll put Taylor McCloy in there now, right? If you take four of the Adrian Bulldogs and you put them up against, you know, four of the Suniac guys or even two of the Suniac guys and, you know, two of the other Division Three type of players, who would win that? And I'm, I'm going to guess that you're going to tell me right now that more than likely the Suniac and the Division Three guys are going to come out on top. But i, I got to be honest well, with McCoy's you. Well, McCoy's on our side. He's an NCAA guy. Well, he is, yes, because he played with Adrian, but it was the Division Division Three club. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, he, yeah, NCAA. Yeah, NCAA, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but I'm gonna guess that you would say because again I've asked I've asked both sides of this and some of the you know the Adrian guys have said you know we could compete with those guys and I, I think you're saying you guys could probably uh, you know take care of them wipe the floor with them yeah wow pretty easily wow wow you guys I love this this is a, this is a great little thing because. What's amazing about this team so far, we'll talk about the Black Bears now and everything, you know, there is a lot of 
you know, a lot of fondness for each other. I, I, I really found that as I've talked to you guys, that everybody really seems to really just like each other. I believe you sit next to Gavin Yates in the locker room, right? Uh, no, I sit across the hall from him, across okay. the locker room. Gotcha. Who, who do you sit with uh, you, you, uh, you know, in the locker room? I have Josh Fletcher on my right and then Liam Anderson on my left. Oh, okay, so another D-man on your left and everything. Yeah. Um, but what is the camaraderie like in the locker room between you guys? It does seem like even though there's that kind of fun playfulness between Adrian and, and the rest of the team, but it does seem like you guys really, really, really do like each other a lot. No, it's definitely the most common thing said is F you for sure, but it's always <laughs> just a common one. It's just uh, joking. We're always at each other's throats, but it's always playful. It's what keeps us honest, keeps us happy, keeps us laughing. It's just a little joking, little camaraderie we have going around the team. Like I, they know I can say anything about. I I'll rip on club hockey every day <laughs> <laughs> just to get a reaction out of them, and then they won't invite me to lunch because I ripped on them. So it just goes back and forth like that. It's just, but why it's good good humor and right. Why is this team so good, though? Because, it, it, I mean, obviously, with only three regulation losses so far on this season and so many wins and, yeah, close calls and overtime and then shootout, none of you guys know how to score a shootout goal, but that's that's you fine. That's, right. yeah, I know. It's it's kind of funny. I've talked about it with uh, with many of you, and, and it's a struggle. And I know even Coach says, hey, we got to work on that more and everything. But why are you guys so good together? Why this team? It's, uh, well, I mean, coming, I've heard horror stories of coming into pro of, like, teams not winning and teams hating each other and guys, the team being a revolving door for players, players are in and out, the locker room is never the same, week to week in, week out, like, don't get comfortable, like, like, sometimes that's, like, coaches' mindsets, and one thing, like, Sherwood, like, has assured us, and, like, one thing that he's been saying is like no no assholes allowed like we got to keep it really clean got to keep a tight ship and let's just all have a common goal of Mm -hmm. winning games and he brought in a bunch of people that have that mindset and you look at guys that are on our third line like some games they get short shifted and then some games they play a lot and score so i mean they know their time will come when their time is. Like, no one's at Sherwood throat about ice time, power play time, or how, why is he playing on second line? I thought I should be on second line. We just have no complainers on the team, which makes Sherwood, Sherwood's life easier, which essentially is keeping us happier. No. <laughs> so it's, I, I, I totally, totally get that. Um, What's the other? What's what also seems interesting to me, and this is something that I've kind of talked to some of the players about. And I want to get your thoughts on it. It seems like because you know you could take Oliveri and Jesse Anderson and switch them from defense to uh, to forward and, and things of that nature. It seems like there's a system in place that Coach Sherwood and Tom Reynolds has in place that you guys just for some reason are able to execute. And obviously, we know that. You know, if you're a Bill Belichick and you have a system in place and you you can plug any player you want into that system and you can win, Do, are the systems good in Binghamton? Is that is that what it comes down to? I know the players are good. I know that you guys like each other, but is it, is the systems that he's got you guys playing good and that's the reason why you guys are winning? I think that's a huge part of it. One thing I've noticed a lot about Sherwood in my past coaches is he's done the research – of the team that's coming up. So, like, we dominated the Ozone against Motor City on Friday. We He came into the locker room earlier that week. was like, hey, guys, week B, Ozone rotation, move your feet, keep pucks low, get them down low, high to low, it works. And then what is what do we do? We do an Ozone rotation, pass up to me. I pass over to Liam Anderson. Liam Anderson shot from the point. Fletcher bangs in a rebound goal. Yeah. It's just... We practice, or he researches, we practice, and we execute. It's, it's kind of got it down to a T. I don't know if I've never had it work so easily for a team. I don't know. It just works. And, and that's we, be... He says it, we just kind of do it, and 
next thing you know, it's in the back of the net. And, and that's got to be kind of exciting for you guys. Now, let me take you back to uh, October 27th of 2023. Okay, do you remember that game, and do you know why you should remember that game? Uh, is that against Watertown? Yes. Um, I believe there was a face-off on the left side of Watertown's netminder. Mm-hmm. We won it back, and I floated one off someone's shin pad and into the back of the net. Yeah, yeah, kind of kind of cool. So that's your first pro goal, and you just remember that, just like that and everything. What was it like, you know, because that was probably the eighth goal of the game, and you guys scored another one even after that because, uh, you know, Connor Smith had to get one as well or his second of the game and everything. Uh, you know, explain to the fans who may, may not understand it. They didn't play pro hockey. They didn't play college hockey, maybe even high school hockey. You know, getting that first pro goal, what does that mean to someone? Oh, it's a huge accomplishment. I mean, I did, whether I watched it go in or not, I didn't even know it went in. So, like, as soon as someone told me it was mine, like, my heart was pumping. And I, I didn't know what to do with my hands. My face is smiling. It's just that first one. That yeah. first one's the hardest. So it's it's just so enjoyable. It's actually sitting right here next to me in my room, cool. all taped up. <laughs> so it's just something I'll never forget, and I'll bring that puck with me everywhere. No, that's pretty cool, and, and, and it's huge. It's, it's an important part. How, um, so let me ask you this question. You're obviously from Minnesota. You know, it's a good 12, 13, 14 hours, whatever it is, uh, distance and everything. Have you had family come out to Binghamton yet for a game? Yeah. Um, my parents have been out twice now. Cool. We had uh, two home games, so they'll take off work on Thursday. It's like an 18 hour drive. Oh, it is 18 hours. Wow. Yeah, so they stop halfway, come here after the weekend, drive back Sunday morning. It's not so I I do not envy them at all. But, I tell them to fly, but my mom's <laughs> not a big flyer, so my dad drives for her. You know how how important is it? You know because you know being a youth hockey player myself, I know how important it was to have uh, parents. You know, take you to games, travel games, get you on a bus, that type of thing, and whatnot. How important is it still, even as a pro, that your your mom and your dad are still supporting you like that, and and driving eighteen hours to get to a game here in Binghamton? Yeah, I couldn't be more fortunate to have parents like that. I know not everyone has the luckiness I have to have parents that are willing to do that that support me in this dream of becoming a, of playing pro hockey. And so they text me all the time, love you, hope you're doing well. And so it's amazing to have that support. Dan, you guys obviously have a weekend, uh, the, the weekend coming up, very tough weekend, two games against Motor City. You guys just played against Motor City, against Trevor Babin, one of the better goalies in the league. And obviously, I believe you had two assists in that game, um, if I remember correctly. You know, this upcoming weekend being three games and three nights, you probably haven't done that that much. Probably not since tournament youth tournament hockey, where you maybe played a couple games in a day and then a game the next day and whatnot. Um, what has the preparation been like for you guys, knowing that you're going into you know two games against Motor City and then having to drive, you know, come back to Elmira to uh, play against the uh, River Sharks? Going into the weekend, our whole mindset has come out with as many points as possible. Yeah. And then going into each game, just focus on this game and then win this one, go on to the next, win this one. If you have the legs for the last game, let's win this one too. But we are really focused as one game at a time. And if we come away with all the points of the weekend, we come away with all of them. But just one game at a time, we'll focus on three points at a time. Yeah, and, and without a doubt. Uh, so, what what is the mindset going into uh, Motor City? You guys have already beat them. They're you know they're second place in the division. They're a good team and everything. But you guys have handled them pretty nicely in the first two games. The the, the two games in Binghamton, obviously. Yeah, that, me and uh, Josh Fletcher were talking about this earlier this morning at practice. We're really. like, I don't know what to expect, and I'm like, I want to go into it. Like, each game I've gone into it expecting a really good game, hard fought, and, like, we walk out, this is an easy game. Right. So I don't – it's hard to go into a mindset, like, this is going to be a hard fought battle, let's do this. 
when we've walked all over in the past two games. So that's something we're definitely going to have to focus on is playing our game and not allowing them to come back or allowing them to walk over us in their own barn. Yeah, what's what for you and for the team? What is the goal this season? Bring back the cup and have a parade in Binghamton. Yeah, well, we've only had one in fifty-one years, one parade here in Binghamton, so that would be uh, definitely uh, very nice and everything. Uh, Dan, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, you're a Miss Minnesotan, so I'm always rooting for you guys. Uh, even if you're not a Golden Gophers fan, that's fine. I know in football you are, but it's, uh, in hockey you are not, and everything. And that's that's okay. Uh, it's okay by me. I gotta say that people from Minnesota, we have uh, someone who who uh, worked. Uh, for us who was from Minnesota, greatest kid in the world and everything. So um, definitely appreciate you coming on the show and talking to us. Yeah, like I said, very happy. I got the opportunity to talk to you today and had a great time chatting with you. It was awesome. Awesome. And we'll be right back right after this, right here on the Power Play Post Show. If you're a Binghamton hockey fan, then you need to check out BinghamtonHockey.net for all your news, stats, information, the Binghamton Hockey Hall of Fame, top 10 lists, profiles, and so much more. That's BinghamtonHockey.net. You're listening to the Power Play Post Show. And welcome back, everybody, to the Power Play Post Show. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Big four games and six nights coming up for the Binghamton Black Bears. So we'll see how they make out. Uh, the league has a lot of games. Only four games, I believe, on Friday night and then five games on Saturday night. So uh, some big games. If you're uh, not going to a, a hockey game, obviously, and you're a Binghamton fan, Please check out all the episodes of the Power Play Post Show. They are all up on Spotify, Apple Music, and all the different ones. All right. The Power Play Post Show is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio. Just search for Power Play Post Show on whichever platform you listen to your podcast and subscribe. Please join the Facebook uh, group, Power Play Post Show. Just go to Facebook and search for Power Play Post Show and share with any of your friends and family. Check out BinghamtonHockey.net for all your Binghamton hockey information and curiosity. And thank you very much to Rob Bopolis, our MC, G, uh, John Petitucci, our musical director, and Binghamton Black Bears defenseman Dan Weber. Folks, we'll be back on Sunday to talk about these three games on Super Bowl Sunday. You may not listen until Monday. I completely understand. I totally understand that it's we can't compete against the biggest uh, sporting event of the year, but that's okay. Just listen to us on Monday, uh, but we'll have the show up on Sunday evening after the game against the Elmira River Sharks, and that will include um, – Six more questions with Dan Weber. So there's going to be a little extra with Dan Weber on that show on Sunday, which will be very cool. And then we'll have another show again next Thursday here on the Power Play Post Show. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Howard. And, uh, you know, have fun and uh, be safe this weekend. for listening to this edition of the Power Play Post Show. Be sure to tune in next week to the Box Studios Radio Network for all the latest Black Bears news and interviews from around minor league hockey. The Power Play Post Show would like to thank John Patitucci for all the music you hear on the show. You've been listening to the Power Play Post Show.